absolute pleasure to welcome our first speakers today. And we, our topic is called AI Changes Everything. I'm delighted to introduce, and I was reminiscing on the talk from last year, a gentleman who literally wrote the book on AI, Mr. Donald Clark, who's the CEO of Plan B Learning. And he's joined by Carla Arts, who is, the future, who is a future of education consultant and thought leader. So with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to you both. I'm looking forward to your session. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Alex. Hey, Donald. Um, good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you here. Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be with you. Um, Donald, um, yeah, it will change everything. But, you know, to kind of contextualize that a little bit, it's probably worth kind of highlighting that AI is not just one thing. So there's a kind of fluid definition of AI. And um, we have the default mode now, which is chat GPT. But actually, AI is far more than that, and, and obviously, the way it will change everything will be far more than ChatGPT. So, I sort of wanted to kick off, um, you know, discussing that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think when anybody comes up to me and uses the phrase artificial intelligence, I have a sort of internal bullshit meter that sort of springs into action because the word, so the, the guy who invented the, the phrase, John McCarthy, in 1956, which was the year of my birth, <laughs> I'm that old. Uh, that explains it, though. Yeah. Well, it was the first major, college, it was at Dartmouth College, the first major conference in AI in the modern era. I went to that university, that's where I came across the whole AI thing. The interesting thing about him is he regretted coining the phrase. And he actually wanted to, he tried to stop it and rename it computational intelligence, which I think that actually is a better phrase, but it's a bit dull and clumsy. Nevertheless, when people use the word, I think, Clara, they, they mean one of three things, I think. One was the generative AI people who only really came, only discovered it in November the 30th last year. Then there are people who are maybe aware of AlphaFold and some of the things about, you know, the, the previous five to six years before it. That's a wee bit more awareness. But the real practitioners, the people who have got degrees in the subject and so on, it's a much wider, wider entity and includes symbolic AI. There's a whole lot of different schools, evolutionary algorithms. You know, it's a much more sophisticated. So people come with entirely different meanings of the word. And, it's, and actually, because it's moving so quickly, yeah. I think it has semantic shift. There's one thing that really annoys me, though, is the phrase stochastic parrot. Whenever anybody utters that phrase to me, my bullshit alarm goes off at full pelt. And I so, always, Donald, why is, why is that bullshit alarm going well, off then? Well, yeah. because, because, and I always say to people, where did you get that phrase from? And nobody, not one person has ever given me the answer, because it's a meme. It's a meme on the internet. And it actually came from a paper written in 2021 by a, a person called Bender. And the paper is a disaster. The paper actually said that, like, this is before G GPT, the paper said, oh, these large language models, they don't scale, they don't work. Yeah, really? So when people get, and it's not a parrot, for God's sake, you know, it doesn't parrot anything. It freshly mints every word. It's not, it doesn't sample like a rap record or something. It's the, the most dumbass meme in the field. Now, there are some people who know that paper and actually know what stochastic means, and, but they're like one in a hundred when they use that phrase. So it's a bit of a minefield. Yeah, and I would also say that um, you touched on two things uh, for me, which is the kind of the large language model and the language, because it's quite interesting if you look at it from an educational perspective, how important language is becoming again. And we sort of, you know, our focus has been on STEM and maths and, and for a very good reason. I'm not uh, trying to kind of belittle that, but actually the concept of the use of language and the use of conversation and dialogue, which also in education too often is put to one side because it's kind of instructional rather than dialogue. And so the kind of the shift from language to dialogue in pedagogy and education that is kind of moving us into a new paradigm of machine person yeah, uh, and machine machine person person yeah. um, and so that for in, in education will um, will change everything yeah, yeah. Um, there's an interesting angle in this so as as the whole world shifts from monologue this is a sort of monologue powerpoints lectures that 
I'm not against some of that stuff. Direct instruction in education is actually quite a powerful method. But it's interesting to ask what what does the learning science say about this switch? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, from monologue to dialogue. Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, if you're working in higher education, we should look at the research base. And there are some quite interesting people to check up on here. Uh, you know, you could go back to Socrates, but that's a bit weak. <laughs> you know, it's a bit of hackneyed sort of source, really. But I think there are two or three theories that are interesting on the dialogue issue, yeah. and, and then secondly, the language. On the dialogue thing, you have Bakhtin, who's written extensively. Bakhtin's a really interesting Russian, but Mikhail Bakhtin, yeah. really worth reading. Because he thinks that, he actually thinks all learning is dialogic or dialogue. So I don't know if you, how many of, of you have taught in a, I don't mean in the university, I mean in our school, trying to teach 16 year olds mathematics who don't want to learn it. It's the hardest thing you'll do in your life. And if you don't understand dialogue, you won't last five minutes, because you ain't lecturing to these kids. So that, now, when Bakhtin talks about dialogue and dialogic, he means actually your internal dialogue with yourself. It's a yeah. very sophisticated concept, but really worth reading. Another guy is Gordon Pask. Gordon Pask spent his whole life building a thing called conversational theory, which is all about how we use dialogue in the learning sphere. So those two guys are really, really worth reading. But you said something really interesting here, I think, Carla, which is language. So one of the things that the large language model thing has landed like a meteorite in the learning space has shown us is that language really matters. And there are really two thinkers I've really resurrected because I think they're right on this. One is Wittgenstein and another is Vygotsky. So Wittgenstein said, yeah, actually, Interestingly, Wittgenstein has a thing called family resemblance. So this word bottle is linked to glass. The bottle is linked to talk and label. It's like a family resemblance of concepts, which is exactly how that data works in large language models. It was actually quite prescient. In other words, meaning comes from the relationship of the word in that context. The second thing he had was language games. So to, is it the 25th of January today or to, tomorrow? Tomorrow is tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow is Burns Night, okay? And if you're Scottish, it's a big celebration. And so I have written the address to the haggis in the voice of Donald Trump using ChatGPT. Now, why can it do that? Why can it go? It's a haggis. It's a great haggis. It's the greatest haggis book because it plays a sort of language game. Well, Wittgenstein. So this is a language game, a dialogue with an audience. A lecture is a language game. Being in the pub chatting is a language game. And you can get ChatGPT to do that. So I think Wittgenstein is very interesting. But the big one is Vygotsky because yeah. he thought intelligence was a function of language. Not that, so a lot of people would imagine that language is a function of intelligence. And he sort of flipped it saying, no, language is fundamental to learning. It's what mediates learning initially from parents, siblings, peer groups, eventually teachers and schools, your work colleagues. But this whole notion that you have mediation with language, that's how we actually learn, using your phonological loop and internal processes. And then on top of that, you use tools. It's very big on what a tool is. But I'm absolutely sure if Vygotsky was sitting here, he would love ChatGPT because it does everything he thinks you should do in learning. Yeah, totally. So I those, totally agree with you. I've drawn yeah. a great deal from those people in there. And obviously, I think there's a really good, solid research base behind this. The conversational theory is another thing which supports the use of these, this dialogic approach in learning. The, the interesting thing there is also for, there might be people in here who are quite interested in assessment, um, how you can use that approach in assessment. and. Um, some of you may have heard of uh, Professor Paul Kim at Stanford. He came up with a kind of inquiry-based assessment, mobile uh, assessment system, actually before generative AI exploded, and he saw it coming because he's an AI specialist. Um, and basically, his rationale for the system was, you know what, guys, you're not going to answer any question, but you're going to ask it, and you're going to ask it working together. And we can rate you on work on the level and the sophistication of the question you've asked. And guess what? When we're prompting these engines or these uh, these agents rather, um, what's happening here? The more sophisticated you get into into your questioning and the deeper you go into the questioning, the more you get out of your ChatGPT or your Bing or whichever whichever um, um, yes. agent you're using, and 
he was ahead of the game and it obviously was pretty much a research project. He actually launched it in Africa and in a number of developing nations to kind of flip the concept of assessment. And I think that is something we really need to start thinking about is, you know, it's sort of uh, the whole knowledge game, right, in, in, this, in this space. What does knowledge actually still mean? And why are we still hammering on a purely knowledge-based curriculum, especially in schools and university, I would say, um, that doesn't take into account that there's actually much more to kind of um, the skills that you need to thrive in the world and, and to engage with people, but also to engage in dialogue and communication and, and constructive thinking, uh, than just regurgitating and swatting for your GCSEs, which is the worst thing you can possibly have to do. Um, and for me, that's an interesting flip in terms of, you know, how do we assess people and how do we kind of um, ensure the learning transfer is actually happening, going back to the learning science and stuff, and, 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 and Vygotsky and, 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 and Vaccine. Um, so this is, for me, one of the most, where it will change everything. And I think education needs to start looking, rather than saying, oh, everybody will cheat for their papers. I mean, that is just the worst thing you can possibly say as an institution about your students and your learners, is you guys, uh, this, this is now here and you're just all going to cheat. Um, this is terrible. This is, you know, this shows that maybe we need more imagination in the institution to kind of look at where this is going. So. Um, I, ha I have almost no interest in assessment in AI at all. No, 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 but I'm, I'm just, there yeah, are no, probably think, people I think, here, yeah, that are. Because yeah. Was, I think yeah. you were right. I remember like about five, seven years ago, everybody I knew was getting grants on blockchain. I always thought that was bullshit. Yeah. That didn't happen because they're obsessed by credential. HE is obsessed. It's really a credentialing game, really. And so they all got their, none of those blockchain projects ever worked. They're all dead, a complete waste of money. Suddenly they run out of money on those grants. Our AI and assessment will all jump onto that one yeah. now. But the truth of the matter is your, your students have been cheating forever. You, you know, Absolutely. The, the AI essay mills have been around. I, I used to be involved in consultancy on this. Add up the turnover of, and I live in Brighton, I have two universities. I can tell you how many essays were written, especially by foreign students, because the fear of going back and failing is so enormous. They've been cheating the hell out of your system for years. And it's, academics don't want to go down the route of admitting that they know because it's dangerous for them. I mean, I wrote a whole chapter on cheat technology. You wrote a technology thing. You know, in India, you can buy a false arm that you put on the desk so your other arm can cheat underneath. You can buy invisible microphones. There are Indian kids who actually get surgery to put microphones inside it. It's all happening. And you know, you know what kids do? This is how bad assessment is in higher education. Yeah, I have a degree in philosophy. I memorized the essays for my finals. Like every other person who sat a humanities degree in the history of higher education. You don't go in and, first of all, who writes critically, starting top left, going bottom right in a pen? Have you ever written anything in your life? You don't, you don't change the structure of the sentences? I mean, I remember my kids getting a pencil to do essays and they'd find like, I never looked at it as if it was an Egyptian artifact. They don't use pencils. So I think, you know, you're, the credentialism is a busted flush in higher education and you're pretending it's true, but it isn't. So last week, a really interesting article I read, 7,800 Indian kids to uh, applications in Canadian universities, every single personal statement was chat GPT written. And they know that because they were shameless. Some of them were absolutely identical. So you're in trouble here, but that's because assessment is hopeless. And you're not assessing anything by just shunting out one line essay type stuff. You're just not assessing at all. I've run big companies, had hundreds of graduates. I hardly ever get them to write anything because they ain't going to be writing essays when they come and work from them. And I think what we've done is higher education, really, and starting with the printing press, is so text soaked, it's so reliant on text, it misses everything else. You can assess hardly anything in the real world using text, but that's the only assessment methods most people use. It's just totally and utterly bizarre. Yeah. 
So I, I think actually that I'm far more interested in teaching and learning, you know, they're the big, the big oh, Same here, absolutely, yeah. Ilya, but so I mean, unfortunately, the institution is still wedded to assessment, yeah. and we need to kind of start breaking that mold, yeah. um, because it's much more about the question. It, about I don't think it's here. going to happen, though. I think it's unreformable. Yeah. The interesting thing that may make it reformable in the US is the hypothesis that every academic has to go through a plagiarism checker for all their past work and existing work. So we have, we've had two presidents of two major universities, including Harvard, who have been ousted. It's partly right-wing politics. Yep. But it's an interesting proposition here that if everybody had to submit everything they've ever done to a plagiarism checker, I would be nervous. I'm sure everybody in here would be nervous because it's all a bit scrappy and there's no absolute line between plagiarism and a bit of fiddling around the sentences at the beginning of your paper. So I think we're, you know, we've got to be very careful about being accusatory on this thing, blaming students all the time, but also with us, like, we need yep. to chill out a little bit here on this. But I, I agree I think, with you. I yeah. think turning to teaching would be a real good thing. <laughs> right. The other thing, Donald, is, um, you know, people, uh, Quite often when, when we talk about AI, they sort of have this uh, anxiety about the intelligence and the intelligence that's going to take over from us. I find that a bit bizarre because for me it's like, you know, the feedback and the human in control and the AI is my uh, co-pilot to navigate the world and, and to to learn and to to learn better um, so the concept of intelligence i mean i don't want to go too deep into this but the kind of collective intelligence i wanted to sort of talk about a little bit in terms of how are we going to move into a new world of a new kind of intelligence uh, from us working with the machine and how that is going to kind of enhance enhance learning if we kind of construct it well. Um, where do you see this going? Well, I'm less interested in the semantics of the word intelligence as yep. to where it's going on the teaching front. And I'm not, I am not convinced by this notion that of human exceptionalism that I've heard this for years and years and years. You'll never get rid of the teacher. Yeah, really? I haven't been on a course for 40 years. Not one. And on the horizon now, for the first time, I used to agree with that premise until November 22. Because for the first time, you see real examples now. So let me give you some real examples. Already in higher education, it's all happening, not in Europe, or in the, it's happening in the US. Uh, Ashok Gohl at Georgia Tech has been using, I mean, he had nine teaching assistants on his artificial intelligence course. Brilliant kids, straight A students, Georgia Tech, swap one out for a teaching book, none of the kids spotted it. In fact, we put it up for a teaching award. It's an old example, but Ashok has been doing this since 2016. He's now folded ChatGPT into his bot, giving it 2 plus 2 equals 5 power. If you did CS50 course at Harvard on the introduction to computer science that every single student in Harvard wants to do because it's the most important course on your CV, that's now AI driven. So three AI, there's a, 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 a sort of rubber duck chatbot thing using ChatGPT, using rag techniques and so on that support the course. Because if you want to score, scale from one to 10, from one to 30 in a school, one to 100 in a university, or one to 500 or one to 1,000 and on, you have no choice other than to use this technology. Absolutely none. There is no way you're giving any form of individual feedback to 500 people. Now these systems are doing precisely that, and I really recommend the gun paper on this because there's some really good research hitting the streets now. So that's a real experiment looking at the efficacy of this technology on feedback alone. And so they left that there were three forms of feedback studied. Those uh, peer feedback, uh, individual student feedback, uh, and also AI chat GPT feedback. In all three cases, it was outperforming what they had previously. So I think feedback is a really big one. Yeah. But remember what the Harvard course is. You can go and do that course on edX right now without encountering a single teacher. And it's a bloody good course because you're doing stuff. 
and you're getting feedback, feedback, you're, it's making you code. You will do some C and some Python and JavaScript, and it will inspect your code automatically and give you feedback that's so extraordinary no human being could do it on that scale. So I think we have real examples hitting the streets already of this technology, and it's not even a year, it's only a year and three months old. But why is it happening in the US and nowhere else? Because they're not getting bogged down in the ethics and abstract discussions around AGI and whether it's going to be more. If anybody here works in AI, it's so difficult to do anything that the, the, the idea that it's going to murder you in your bed one night is so preposterous, it astonishes me. This whole, it's not really ethics, because people aren't looking at ethics here. They're moralizing, you know, they want to kill it. They're scared of it. But actually, all that talk of AI running amok is such bullshit, because it's a defense mechanism. Yeah, it's, really. it's because we're letting it, yeah. you know, yeah. through the defense mechanism, yeah, so we're I'm letting saying, it. Suppose I said to you all, I've got, I've got an envelope in my back pocket, it's got this amazing piece of technology, it's going to free your lives up forever. You'll all spend a huge chunk of your income on it, but 1.4 million people a year will die horrible mangled deaths, like a world war casualty list. Another 1.8 to 2 million will have life-changing injuries. How many people want the envelope from my back pocket. Hands up. No, well, you all did it. You bought a motor car, didn't you? You bought a motor car, an amazing piece of technology, and 1.4 million people die mangled deaths, and another 2 million die. But we don't have professors of professors of ethics and motoring, but boy, have I seen a lot of professors of AI and ethics pop up since November last year. Where did they all come from? Suddenly in a day, everybody's an expert on ethics. Yeah. Really? We weren't going to talk about ethics in this session. <laughs> yes. well, it, it so annoys me because yeah. I think actually it, it will be the death knell of Europe. So I don't know if you look at the regulations that are coming out of Europe at the moment, they are absolute shambles. And the great danger is that we will use, literally Europe will be yeah, in dire have big... straits because it's, that's why I point to America. If you want to look at the research, it's all coming out of the US now. Yeah, it is. No, no, I agree with you. And, yeah. and I think Europe needs to change its game. Um, so if, um, on that front, Donald, um, You've highlighted the research is coming from America, the technology, I mean China has got its own AI world for sure, um, India is starting to emerge in that, on that front as well, but certainly for us it's all coming from the States. Yeah. And what do you do about that? Because I can't see anything emerging in Europe that has kind of got a, the counter argument uh, in terms of you know, the prowess and the power of, of, of where this is going. And what is the role, given that we're talking about higher ed here, what is the role there of universities to kind of drive this? Because to me, it seems as, as if universities either don't have the budget, don't have the kind of uh, prowess to move, whereas in, in the States, the landscape is more fluid between the commercial research and the, yeah. and the AI researcher. It's, it's rather exceptional in this part of the world, I think. Um, so how do you see that kind of evolve in terms of you know the university landscape needing to change to kind of make sure that we come up with some clever AIs uh, too? Well, well, as always, I have a sort of belief in this because I'm old, I think, that the higher education system in, in the UK especially, because we sell a traditional model to yep. students, that's what keeps it all afloat now. You know, that yield, jolly England, Oxbridge thing. Europe's slightly different and America's very, very different. But I think, you know, when, when I look at my lifetime and see how have things reformed in higher education, there's only one person that matters to me. And uh, she was a woman called Annie Lee. And anybody know who Annie Lee is? Nobody. 
Annie Lee is an amazing woman who was a minister in the Harold Wilson government in the 60s, wrote a white paper recommending the Open University. Yeah. It was fought like tooth and nail by the higher education establishment. Nobody wanted the Open University. What's the biggest university in the UK as we speak right now? 173,000 students, the Open University. Anybody know what the biggest university in the US is? By student number. No? No? ASU, is it? No, S S N H U. Nobody's ever heard of it. South New Hampshire University. 200,000 students. An amazing place. Paul LeBlanc, read his book, Students First. He took it from 2,500 to 200,000 students. And that's because things happen from the outside. The Open University didn't happen from within higher education, it happened to it. Now, I think something similar will happen in AI. Now, go back to Ashok Gold has been talking about this for a while. I, don't, I think you'll see the emergence of some quite powerful players in the US, not Europe, that will come which are really AI-driven universities, which take advantage of this huge scalability of this technology to both help teaching and learn. Now, the learning side is far more important than the teaching side. I totally agree with you on that. And that's because teaching is fossilized in higher education around lecturing. Yeah. And you can't shift it. I get, I, you know, I've, I've been in and out of universities all my life. They always ask me to lecture. And I go, you know, lecturing is really easy. Teaching is really hard. <laughs> That's why people love lecturing. It's so easy to walk up, rattle on your PowerPoint for an hour and walk up. It's the easiest thing in the world. Try teaching. That's a really different game, which is why I like secondary school teachers. They know about teaching. Now, how are we going to get out of this quandary? Well, I think we already have several really good academic papers. The, the evidence is flooding onto the market now that it gives you, from the learner's perspective, all your students are using this technology. They've been using it for ages. So when I hear a university saying, oh, we're going to run a course on prompting for the students, I go, who's going to deliver that course? <laughs> Oh, you experts. Probably the students, I'd say. Yes. <laughs> exactly. If I want help, like, I'm an AI guy, and I think I know this stuff technically and so on, but I go to my two sons for uh, real advice on this stuff because they're immersed in that world. Yeah. So I think your students will be using it, are, they are using it. For, I mean, let's talk about the learning journey, learning engagement. I hate the word engagement and learning, you know? I think it's just such a crap word. I go to the Edinburgh Festival every year. I love stand-up comedy. A good friend of mine is a stand-up comic, and I've been doing it for years. Massively engaged. Every time, I love it. Can't remember a single joke. Not one. And that's because it's not about that type of fun engagement at all. It's a very serious business learning. Absolutely, and I, I, I'm glad you said it, because it often gets like, yeah. it has to be fun. Yes, it has to be fun, but it has to be trigger the curiosity to learn. Yeah. And learning can be incredibly hard, and we shouldn't kind of belittle that. And I, I think that is one of the things that sometimes in edtech we go on the wrong path, because we kind of start being like, it all has to be fun. It can't all be fun, because like you're saying, yeah. it's messy and it's difficult. Well, I think, in, in that sense, I think you should be giving seriously helping your students use AI on note-taking, for example, there's a really interesting guy speaking immediately after this called Dave Tucker, he runs a company called Glean, and he's using AI to affect that bridge from the notes in a lecture, because you ain't going to stop people lecturing, let's be realistic. You know that bridge in, because most kids don't learn in a lecture room, they learn in the library in the quiet of their own room. But if you can get that bridge right, so note-take, the, the reason lectures are so terrible is, you know, you're sitting take notes, as you take the note, the lecturer's moved on, you miss it. So you, and so what we do is we take the transcript, compare it to the lecturer's transcript, and see if the student's got any gaps, and then help them, and then self-generate self-assessments, links to the web, all sorts of stuff. But the interesting thing here is I think the way this is going is to really help students to learn. And I would extend your teaching. You know, you can only do your lecture. You've only got so much time. You really want to be doing research. Let's be honest. You go, into the, you go into that world, but make sure you have got autonomous environments for your students to really, really learn effectively. Optimize their learning using this technology. It's not about you telling them how to use AI, because they know more. Was kind of a, a deviation curve here, you know. The vast, the 100 million people who are using this, I go to universities and I say, how many people have got ChatGPT4? <laughs> really? 
and you're, and you're going to teach AI and you haven't even used four yet? Because most of them have got this sneaky, you know, actually I've only got 3.5 and all that stuff you see in Twitter. Oh, look, you can't do this. Well, that's because you're using ChatGPT 3.5. And that's like using Wikipedia from 2006. So I think, you know, we've got all that stuff. Another one we, we haven't touched upon is research. I, I really, yeah, I just wanted to get to that. Because yeah. we've only got really a minute left and yeah. we've got a couple of questions, but that's a really big area. It's already, you know, I'm working with a major publisher who's already doing all loads of peer review using ChatGPT. Using chat GPT type technology to do all the peer review because that process is glacial. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you, you have had not had any research in AI because it takes a year and a half to publish anything, and by that time the technology has moved on by a year. Which is also what Eric Smith is trying to do with his AI research initiative, where you know the kind of digestion, yeah. for want of a better word, of papers and the amalgamation of thousands and thousands of papers to inform yeah. you know the research will just accelerate the research uh, you know trajectory as well as kind of lead to new knowledge creation because that's what we're going to be doing with this with uh, with these uh, chat gpt type tools is new knowledge creation yeah. uh, I think also this will, so I think teaching students how to do research properly is a really difficult thing. Yeah. It's subtle. So it's lots of soft skills and it takes ages to teach it. But I think that's one really area that's really right for exploitation here because the technology does it quite good. Everything from the title of the paper, all that stuff at the beginning, all that meta study type stuff, it can all be automated. You know, you know we, of course, AI already automated that. I'm old enough, when I did my PhD, I had to walk miles up and down library shelves to get books and journals. That's now a second. I think you should all take six months off your PhD students. Honestly. Agreed because it's so easy to get access to the past research now. And then on top of that, all the critiquing and on data analysis, use these tools for data analysis. If, you do, if you've done any peer review, you'll know how crap data can be. You can do the interrogation of open input answers and qualitative research using the AI. Think about how much time that would save you. So there's a whole rack of things on the research front. I, I think we need to come back for that discussion, don't know, because we're yeah. starting to run out of time, unfortunately. But I, I agree with you, the research domain would make a very interesting topic to yeah. maybe you and I should sit here next year. Yeah. <laughs> to I talk want, about that. I, I want to put one thing in well being. Yeah. Have a look at psychologists, 3.5 million people, kids, students looking at well-being box. Yes. Absolutely amazing phenomenon. And there are more formal examples of that coming out. Replica is another one, where they think about 3% of the people who've been using it, it has really prevented suicidal thoughts. AI will surprise you. There's one. Who would have thought that AI, because it's anonymous, students ain't going to come to faculty for help on this, and they're not going to go to their parents. But look at the stats for suicides in higher education. It's horrifying. It there's is. a surprise as and, well. And there's an interesting thing uh, there too, is that elder spend by millennials and Gen Z is all going on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>